everybody. Welcome. Let's sing a couple tunes to get us ready to go for worship today. We're happy to see you.
Thank you, Ben. That was lovely. Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Our Saviors, whether it's in person or online this morning. I just have a few announcements before we transition to our prayer of the day. I want to invite you to join us after worship for coffee and treats out in the atrium. And then also uh, to wish everyone, even though it's not really Independence Day weekend, that doesn't happen until Tuesday, but a safe and healthy Independence Day celebration on July 4th. <clears throat> I want to remind people as well, this is the last day to sign up for the Twins game on August 6th. So if you would like to do so, the sign-up sheet is on the East Welcome Desk. So please don't forget to do that before you leave. We still have tickets available, so we hope you'll join us. I have some news that maybe most of you know about, but some do not know. Ramona Curling passed away on Friday. Her funeral is this Wednesday here at Our, our Saviors at 11.30 a.m. I'll be meeting with Leo and his, <clears throat> excuse me, and his daughters this afternoon. We have a couple of other items as well. Please don't forget, for our 18 to 35-year-old, the in-betweeners, they're going to the escape room on July 15th at 10 a.m. Lunch will follow, and that sign-up as well is at the welcome desk, so we hope you'll do that. Also, one last thing, our next youth bonfire is July 13th. The air quality, of course, will be a deciding factor, but hopefully all will go well, and you'll get to enjoy another bonfire. With that, we now transition to our prayer of the day this morning. Please join with me. God, you direct our lives by your grace, and your words of justice and mercy reshape the world. Mold us into a people who welcome your word and serve one another. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. For our Faces of Faith series, today a reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. Glory to you, Lord. This is a familiar story, but usually we kind of go right through it during the Passion, during Holy Week. Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him, that is Jesus. When they came to the place that is called the Skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. <clears throat> then Jesus said, Father, Abba, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by, watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked Jesus, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God? since you are under the same sentence of condemnation. 
And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we're getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to you. Dear friends, grace and peace to you from God and the Lord Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> now, last week, the families of young children made sure to tell me, you know, now we're going to be gone this weekend because it's going to be a holiday weekend, but we'll be back next time. So, what to do for a children's message this morning since they're gone? But some are actually watching at home. At least that's what they told me, and I'm going to believe them. I believe what people tell me. I really do. And I know it's true because of the people that watch from home, and some of them are very faithful. I think of the Curlings. They've been watching on the Internet for six years at least. It's been quite a while. But I know some of them are telling the truth because they'll mention a particular song, or they'll talk about the message, or the prayers, or the liturgy. So I thought I'd just have a brief message for the kids. So when I was talking to Carr about it, what I thought I would do is I'd read the Declaration of Independence for all the children out there. But then Kara stopped me and said, Mark, no, no, no. No, you can't do that to those poor children. But I said, but come on, listen. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for the people, for one people, to dissolve the political bands, which here, well, you know how it goes. All right, she said no to that. But I thought, but there is one thing I can talk about because it affects all the children of God. So, who here is a child of God? Raise your hand. That's pretty good. Most of you put your hands up. All hands should have gone up, unless you can't raise your hand. We are all children of God. <clears throat> and I know a lot of us like to think, well, you know, but I'm so mature now. It's not about the maturity. It's not about the age. In the Gospels, in Scripture as a whole, again and again, we are named as children of God. And one of the things that is named is freedom. And really, that's what the Independence Day celebration is all about. It's on July 4th that we celebrate our freedom. So what does it mean to be free as a child of God? Well, we know this, and this is especially for young children, but for all of us, even us, quote, older children, Freedom does not mean that we're free to just do and say whatever we want to at every time and in every place. Now, I know that sounds really good. But look at the Gospels, if nothing else. Look at what Jesus says. Look at his commands, his callings for us. We're to be those loving people of God. So we aren't the people to just be free to say hateful, spiteful things. We're not free to willy-nilly to break the Ten Commandments and say, well, it's fine because I have freedom. I'll just keep doing that. No, actually, we are free to do what happened in the gospel today. Free to be like that criminal and to repent. And so for the kids, for the children and all of us, let's begin with this gospel by thinking about what does Jesus free us to do and to be? Jesus frees us as God's children to love one another. We hear it over and over again, but there's a reason why we have to listen to it over and over again. To love neighbor as well as ourselves, to love the stranger, and to love enemies. As Jesus points out, to pray for them. And we have the example in the gospel today. So with that, all children of God, let's look at our gospel today. We have the story in our faces of faith of the penitent criminal on the cross, on the cross with Jesus. And I'm sure no doubt you didn't forget as you heard it again or as you've read through this more than once. There's a Trinitarian aspect here. One on the right, one on the left, there are the three. 
And it's an interesting way to look at this because we see one person who is not repentant, but the other one is. And that juxtaposition between all of this that goes with the scene that has been set at this very last hour of Jesus' earthly life. Because they're at the place of the skull, Jesus has been crucified with these two. And notice what Jesus says next. It might seem like a tough one to take in, but I believe throughout all my years of ministry now, through all the decades, it's an important lesson for all of us. Jesus doesn't pray directly to forgive those, but he says instead, Father, forgive them. To the very end, he does God's will. And he implores God the Father, that perfect parent, that perfect mother for us, our creator, the very creator of the cosmos, to be able to forgive these people who had a hand in this crucifixion. And instead of castigating them from the cross, instead of choosing to point the finger, he says instead, for they do not know what they are doing. The very compassion in his forgiveness is a clarion call for all of us. How we are to forgive. What we are called, commanded, as Jesus commanded us to love one another. What we are commanded to do. But of course, the people stood by, the church leaders scoffed, deride, so did the soldiers. The political authority, of course, are the ones that decide to put him to death because they had the ultimate say. And so there's all this derision. You know, save yourself. You're God's chosen. You're the Messiah, the Savior. Even the one criminal derides him. Save yourself. Save us. And now the story enters into repentance and forgiveness, mercy and reconciliation. Because there is the one, albeit just the one, but there is the one, the one criminal who rebukes the other. And in essence, as we read this story, it's really a rebuke of all of those, all those who are gathered that are deriding Jesus. He rebukes the other criminal and says, do you not fear God? I mean, we're getting, in, in a sense, our just desserts. But this one, Jesus, he is innocent. And then he turns to Jesus and asks us, he asks Jesus to remember me when you come into your kingdom. That song that we sing, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He is asking just like us, asking for forgiveness. He is repentant. He's the penitent criminal. And Jesus, in those last minutes of life, brings forgiveness, brings reconciliation. There is mercy. You'll be with me. An act of forgiveness for a criminal. Once again, Jesus brings forgiveness, comfort, and healing to the least likely, to one of those being crucified with him. One of those people, as we would put it, those undesirables, those people that we would probably categorize as, well, they are beyond help, they are beyond us. I mean, look at their activity. Maybe he's been a criminal his whole life. Let us think on that for a moment. How often have we done it, or at least been tempted, to categorize those others? You know, it used to be, we'd say, from the wrong side of the tracks. But those that we deem irredeemable, those that we say, well, 
even if they did repent, could we really believe them? I mean, aren't they just trying to save their own skin? Well, you could certainly say that of this criminal that's hanging there on the cross next to Jesus. I mean, if ever there's a last-minute effort, I believe this is it. But Jesus forgives. God's forgiveness has no boundaries, has no limits, and has no checklist. I mean, there isn't a checklist to say, well, are you really worthy? Let's go down your whole life story. Let's see. Let's add it all up. And are you really worthy of forgiveness? No. Because every time we repent, immediately we are forgiven. And in the same way, we are called to do that for one another, even if we don't believe them. Because I know there's probably been a time in your life where somebody apologized, they sought repentance with you, they, they sought to receive your forgiveness, and the repentance perhaps didn't ring true for you. It didn't seem genuine. Or perhaps you thought, well, you know, they're just going to go back to it over again. Well, that would be our life story. Because we're all human, and we're all in this together. Jesus forgives. In this moment, we see he is the Messiah. There is no doubt of that. And so when we think of these things, repentance, forgiveness, mercy, reconciliation, this criminal is reconciled to Jesus, reconciled to God. Now, I was looking for some other ways to talk about reconciliation, repentance, forgiveness, and I was inspired when Carr and I went to the play, Something Rotten. Now, some of our church members were in the play. Will you raise your hands? I can see you. There you go. Come on. There you go. First of all, thank you. It was an excellent performance. The actors, the musicians. But it inspired me to think that, you know, it's been a few years since I've quoted from William Shakespeare. It has. It's been since 2019, at least. And you may think, why is that so important? Well, here's my Riverside edition of Shakespeare. Now, at St. Olaf College, some of you know I was a religion major, but my concentrated studies were in philosophy, psychology, and English. So, of course, Shakespeare classes. It was a must. And as I was trying to peruse through, I thought, you know, I've been talking to Rod, some of the other people that, you know, I'll really need to bring Shakespeare in one of these days, but I just haven't thought of the moment. And then I was inspired by that play. I know, kind of an irreverent inspiration, but I think it's apt. From Clifford in Henry VI, Act Four, Scene Eight. And here pronounce free pardon to them all that will forsake thee and go home in peace. Think upon that. Pardon for all. When one seeks pardon from you, when one seeks repentance, are we willing, are we able to forgive? And let's turn that around. When you seek pardon from someone else, whether you've wronged them in a small way or a large way. How easy is that to do? And what is the expectation? Will they forgive you? And if not, how does one respond? These are the kind of questions that are inherent in the gospel today. But if we look to Jesus, we will find the answer. And again, later, Henry VI, later on in Act 5, Scene 6, King Henry utters these last words before he dies at the hands of Gloucester. O God, forgive my sins and pardon thee. I think we're getting the message that Shakespeare knew a little bit about the Bible. 
that had some dalliance in Christianity. Because these words echo what we hear throughout Scripture. And then just a couple more. One that we don't usually talk about, a play anyway, Richard II from Act 5, Scene 3. And the Duchess of York says this, Say pardon first. Pardon should be the first word of thy speech. What would our world be like if that was the first word from us? If that was inherent in our speech? That we were the people of pardon? You know, that we were merciful men and women of God? That we were all about reconciliation and forgiveness? That repentance was freely welcomed, no matter by whom or for what, or whether or not we truly, truly believed in that person seeking the pardon. In response, a little further down, King Henry IV says, I pardon him as God shall pardon me. With all my heart, I pardon him. Today's gospel reminds us that we are indeed people of pardon because that's who Jesus is. And Jesus does so with all of his heart and soul. And even if there are times that you find it difficult, I implore you to look to Jesus as your model. If you're finding it difficult to forgive, then at least beseech God and say, forgive them if you can do nothing else. But I hope and pray that we will be the agents of forgiveness in this world. That no matter who it is, no matter how we feel about him or her, whether locally or globally, that repentance will never come with strings attached. Because that's not how God works. But instead, we will emulate our Lord and Savior that we will always forgive the repentant, whether it be a penitent criminal, a thief, or a criminal far worse. Because Jesus forgives in the very end, and I pray we will be forgiving too. Amen. Please join me 
in our affirmation of faith this day. We believe in a God who meets us in the shadows, who welcomes our questions, who invites us to begin again. We believe that Jesus showed us a new way, a deeper faith, a more compassionate existence. We believe that all of our beginnings should return us to this foundation, and that no matter how many times we lose our way, God always welcomes us home. Amen. Trusting in God's abundant mercy, let us, let us offer our prayers for a world in need. We begin in a brief silence, and the response to God in your mercy is, hear our prayer. We pray for the church, for wisdom to heed the voices of prophets in our midst who cast a vision of God's promised future, for repentance and forgiveness to be in the hearts of all, for courage to welcome people whom society rejects, for resolve to serve all in need. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for creation for Turtle and Dobbins Creek, the Cedar River and Eastside Lake, for all rivers, lakes, oceans, and streams, for lands experiencing scorching heat, drought, or wildfires, especially those in Canada, for conservation organizations and environmental activists, for scientists working on clean energy solutions, God in your mercy, We pray for an end to the violence and rioting in France, an end to the war in Ukraine. We pray for liberty and freedom to be true in all nations. God, in your mercy. We pray for this nation and all nations for national elected leaders, presidents, governors, legislators, for judges, juries, district attorneys, and public defenders, for military personnel, for those who are incarcerated, for political prisoners. Guide us in ways of freedom that promote the common good. God, in your mercy. We pray for those in need for exiles, immigrants, refugees, and those seeking asylum, for victims of harassment, torture, or abuse, for those who are ill and all who are in need of healing, especially Karen, Jay, Catherine, Kelly, Lori, Nancy, and those we name in our hearts. for any near death, and for all who grieve. God, in your mercy. We pray for children, for their safety at home and in child care settings, for their flourishing at summer programs and camps, for the many people who care for them, including parents and grandparents, child care workers and teachers, coaches, counselors, and mentors, pediatricians and psychologists, God, in your mercy. We lift up in prayer Leo Curling and family with the death of his wife, Ramona. We give thanks for all the saints and prophets who have received the free gift of God, which is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. May their lives of humble service inspire us in our faith. God, in your mercy. Receive our prayers and answer us, God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of Christ with you always. We share God's peace with one another this day. At this time, we worship God with our offering.
God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, one mother of us all. You've brought us this far along the way. In the night in which he betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection, we pray that Jesus shall free all the earth from the bonds of slavery and death. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. Friends, you are invited to this table, each of us with our doubts, fears, scars, joy, our dreams, our hopes, and our questions. We are invited to God's table. Here we are met and fed. Here we are given a taste of an expansive life overflowing with love and joy. Come to the table, not because you must, but because you can. This table is for all. These are the gifts of God for the people of God, and all are welcome.
pray. God of grace, there are simply not enough ways to say thank you. We thank you for the way you designed joy to be contagious, for sunsets and sunrises, and for the air in our lungs. Thank you for summer rains and starry nights. Thank you for this sacred space, this table, and for this day, which all hold the promise that love is enough. You give us new life, beautiful life, full life. There are not enough ways to say thank you. We start by acknowledging just how much we need you and with gratitude which overflows. Amen. As you leave this place, God bless you with seeking. Seek out the hungry. Seek the weary. Seek the good in every person you pass. Seek out the hopeful. Seek the faithful. Seek God in each of us. As you seek and as you wonder, may you find the risen Jesus. In the name of our loving God, who is always seeking us. Amen. I invite those able, please rise as we sing our sending song, Our God Saves. Go in peace. Serve the risen one. Please join us in the atrium.